Happy Friday. It's me, John, here with another episode of Brain Scratch for you. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's another Friday, time for another mystery. Uh, sometimes I notice that my cases go in trends, and it seems like uh, I'm kind of doing that right now. There's cases that are really difficult to solve. Obviously, if we look at the past few weeks, we could talk about the Bruce Kruchara case. Uh, also, before that, the Caleb Luckett case. Uh, they're extremely difficult when we're talking uh, gunshot, weapon has been taken, uh, remote locations, not tied to any specific person. Uh, we kind of have some of those trends happening in today's case as well. Uh, today we are looking into the case of Sarah Starr. So um, this is a picture of Sarah. As you can see, she obviously had a very fun personality. She's got the arrow for brilliant pointing to her. Uh, she is a school teacher. She was a school teacher, uh, apparently very caring, and also a mother. Uh, here is a picture of a church. Uh, it's noting that it's in Chancellor, Alabama. We'll get more into the location here, but you can see this kind of rural area, not a whole lot around it, just a church kind of out in the middle of some fields, but there's actually a house behind the church. And this is where Sarah lived, and tr tragically, uh, where Sarah would also die. Um, it's, it's interesting to me because, you know, one of the things that I'm always looking at with these cases is opportunities for cameras. Uh, is there some camera around here that could have caught someone, uh, leaving the residence or going to the residence? And really, I think the only hope we have for that is this church. And unfortunately, as you could tell from these street views, these are from back in May of 2009. The quality is so bad, I can't really get a good sense of, did the church have cameras that might have captured traffic coming to or going from the home? One good thing about where the home is located is this county road that it's on uh, doesn't go all the way through. So um, there is kind of a, it looks like, uh, I mean, it looks like if you had a truck or something, you could definitely continue uh, going through this area, but I'm not sure that it would lead you. Yeah, it doesn't really lead you to anywhere helpful. So the official road, as you can see, as noted by Google, ends uh, just a bit past where that house is. So if someone did have cameras either at the Union Grove Baptist Church or possibly at one of these few residences out here, there's a good chance those cameras could have picked up um, someone driving by that might be related to this case. But unfortunately, we don't have any details like that. Um, I'm just wondering what might be going on with the investigation on that front. So over at Wikipedia, let's learn a little bit about Enterprise. Enterprise is a city in the southeastern part of Coffee County and the southwestern part of Dale County. And uh, this is in Alabama in the United States. If Dale County, Alabama sounds familiar to you, you're probably a fan of Three Men and a Mystery. The first season that we covered um, took place in Dale County. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to have a little update for you guys at the end of this video about what's going on with Three Men. Um, but this is a case that was actually referred to me through the Three Men email account. Someone was like, hey, you know, we've got this other unsolved murder out here we'd really like some help with. Um, I don't think there's enough detail to do a full season of Three Men on it, but I was like, you know what? Let's do a brain scratch on it. Let's see if we can raise some exposure and try to help that case. Let's get into some of the details here and see what we can learn from the local news services. Uh, kind of feels like a flashback to me because I've looked at these news services so often over the past year. But WTVY uh, Channel 4 in the area has a post that they start on um, November 27th. 2017. And unfortunately, the way they do their stuff, they kind of post it backwards, but we're just going to get this one piece out. The Coffee County Sheriff's Office is investigating a homicide. Investigators are not releasing any details at this time, but two enterprise schools have been placed on soft lockdown as a precaution. They are Pinedale Elementary and Coppinville Junior High Schools. Interestingly, neither of those schools is where she actually worked. So why are these schools being put on a soft lockdown? We're gonna to get to that as we go through the details. Let's jump over to the Dothan Eagle to learn more about this case. 
Um, Heron Creek Elementary School is where Sarah Starr was a teacher. I've seen some reports. Most reports are saying she was a fourth grade teacher. I've seen a few reports that say she was a fifth grade teacher. I don't know if those are inaccurate, but uh, most accounts say she was a fourth grade teacher. She was found dead Monday morning at a residence on County Road 647. It was her own home. Uh, From what I understand, I believe she was found in the driveway. District Attorney Tom Anderson said Starr had an apparent gunshot wound to her head, but no firearm was recovered at the scene, which was a key factor in turning the situation into a homicide investigation. Starr's death possibly happened after 6.30 a.m. Monday morning. So this is the weekend after the Thanksgiving holiday. Uh, Seems like she was probably getting ready for work, had left to go to the car, and between the front door and her car, which looks like it was probably very close to where that front door is, uh, this attack happened. A person of interest is being investigated with other avenues being considered for additional suspects and search warrants have been obtained and were executed, Anderson said. No further details were given in order to not compromise the investigation. And we have a quote from Anderson here. There won't be any stone left unturned. I can assure you of that. Uh, always tough when you're talking about someone that's a part of the community like this, especially teachers. You know, we, we trust them with our children. They're a, a big part of what I consider almost an extended family that helps raise all of us, you know, the village that's that's raising the child. Um, so when you have one of those people harmed, it's, it's, it's really kind of heartbreaking because you're already talking about someone that usually takes that job out of passion for helping others. Uh, we've all heard many stories about the fact that teachers are underpaid. Um, so it's a different thing that drives someone to become a teacher. And then to have them kind of brutally executed in this way would certainly raise a lot of questions, but I think it would also rally the support of the community, all those parents of all those children that she has helped through the years. But outside of that, also local law enforcement, um, you know, the the, the government wants to protect its employees as well. And they're, they're all working together to help our communities grow and thrive. And for someone to be taken out of that role in such a, a brutal way, um, I'm sure elicited a very big response from the community. Let's continue here and see if we can learn, is there some kind of motive in, in this case? Who might the person of interest be? Uh, continuing at HayesPost.com, this is essentially a um, obituary for Sarah, so we can learn a little bit more about her and also try to honor her memory here. Sarah Elizabeth Schubert Starr, age 38, of Chancellor, Alabama, passed away Monday, November 27th, 2017. So I know I read you the description for Enterprise, Alabama. That's kind of the main town that is close to Chancellor. uh, And I believe that's where the school is that she worked at. So Chancellor is just a little bit outside of what you would consider Enterprise proper. Uh, And all of that is essentially, I believe, west of Dothan, the case that we covered on Three Men. Sarah Elizabeth's children were the loves of her life. Now that's something I haven't even really touched on yet outside of the fact that we have all these people that are affected by losing someone like that in the community. We also have uh, four children that she had. I believe she also had an older stepson and they've lost their mother in this as well. Uh, She loved them more than anything else. She loved her parents, grandparents, siblings, and other family members. Teaching was always her dream. She excelled in the classroom and was loved by her students. Photography was one of her many interests. Sarah was a member of the Union Grove Baptist Church in Enterprise, Alabama. So that church that effectively was steps from that home, it seems she was also a member of, which I guess would kind of make sense. Uh, It might even be a deciding factor or in some way related to why she was living in that area. Jumping over to southeastsun.com. Also assisting in the investigation were officers from the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency and the Enterprise and Dothan Police Departments. Uh, Once again, just one of the police departments from the three men case. So... uh, I'm just calling this out here because, you know, typically in murder investigations like this, they will reach out to other agencies to try to get help. Sometimes they'll share resources. Sometimes that'll even reach up to uh, federal level agencies like the FBI. At this point, 
when this is going down, we don't have that quite happening yet, but definitely all the local resources are circling around this case. Starr was a fourth grade teacher at Herond Creek Elementary School and the mother of at least four children, Anderson said. Starr is originally from Kansas and has lived in the area for more than 10 years, Anderson said. Her parents have been contacted. The children's father, so for the four children, uh, lives in Coffee County, that's also in this area, and he has been in contact with authorities. Four of Starr's children attend two Enterprise City schools. So, um, you know, part of sharing these stories is always trying to find kind of the good mechanisms that are happening in these cases, and I really appreciate this mechanism. Effectively, what happened was... Um, she didn't show up for work. Uh, we know that she was shot sometime around 6.30, but I believe it was sometime after 8 where staff members at the school said, hey, where is she? This is not like her, like her. Someone went to try to find her and they found her in the front yard, obviously, after the assault. What happens at that point is police are called in and they're notified, hey, she has children, um, two sets of twins actually, and they go to these two specific schools. The authorities then contact those schools, initiate that lockdown, uh, and get in contact with those children immediately. I think that's such a good process. Uh, you know, but by far the majority of solved murders can be traced back to someone that the victim actually knows. So in a case like this, I think it was really smart to think of the risk to the children. I think it was really smart to address that risk extremely quickly. Uh, and then, of course, on top of that, at the school that she was from, they brought grief counselors in and started rolling out all those processes as well. Um, but I just wanted to call that out. Just a really good process. I really appreciate they got on the ball like that. We've seen cases before where if this is a family member, and obviously, I, I think at this point, all of you are thinking, hey, what's going on with this father out there? Um, so we're going to get into much more information about him. But in cases like that, where it could be a family member that has done something like this, protect the children. And that's exactly what they did. And I just want to call them out for doing a great job at that. Uh, continuing over at AL.com, Star was the mother of two sets of twins, ages 12 and 7. But thankfully, the children weren't home at the time of her death. Coffee County Sheriff Dave Sutton told WBRC that the children had spent the previous night at the home of their father, Jason G. Starr. A divorce between the children's parents had been finalized in July. And from what I understand, that was a process that had gone on for uh, a few years. Uh, continuing with more info back at DothanEagle.com. From May 23rd, 2018, Coffee County Sheriff tight-lipped about updated information in Sarah Starr murder. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to get much more detail. Um, there's some kind of development, some type of discovery that he makes. He really can't tell us what it is, but let's see if we can learn anything else from this article. It's been almost four months since Coffee County Sheriff deputies responded to a call regarding the murder of Starr. We are continuously working this case, said Coffee County Sheriff Dave Sutton. I want the community to know solving this case is our top priority. Yes, we do have updated information on this case, but I can't release it right now. This case is in no way considered a cold case, Sutton said. We have law enforcement on local, county, state, and federal levels working this case. A $5,000 reward was authorized by Governor Kay Ivey's office. So... At this point, we're hearing that team that they're putting together to address this case is reaching federal levels. On top of that, we have the governor stepping up and authorizing a $5,000 reward. Um, just clear indicators about how this is affecting the community and how the community is trying to address this. Uh, jumping over to WTVY.com, this is a photo of her ex-husband, uh, Jason Starr, and we get some pretty disturbing news. This is going down May 25th, 2018, so we're talking just about six months after the murder of his ex-wife. Coffee County Sheriff Dave Sutton tells us deputies arrested 45-year-old Jason Starr Thursday on one count of first-degree sexual abuse. Sutton declined to release additional information due to the nature of the crime and the age of the girl. 
Uh, this is with someone that is very young. I've seen the formal charge, and I believe that it is someone under the age of 12. Jason and Sarah Starr, married in 2001, were divorced last year and shared custody of their four children. However, they remained involved in court proceedings until her death. Records show Jason Starr was served with a child support withholding order just several days before Sarah Starr died. Following this week's arrest, Starr posted bond and is now out of jail. So warning indicators, yes. Um, but I want to be clear that at least with the media that I'm seeing here, I think they're doing a fair job of how they're reporting this. No one is tying these events together. No one is coming forward and, and making a conclusive statement. Hey, this guy is looking like our suspect. The police aren't saying this guy is our main suspect or our person of interest. Um, media is reporting on what's going on. But I also understand that there's probably concerns because with these kind of details, it's starting to look a little strange. And we're, I'm myself, I'm starting to think, okay, what's going on with this guy? Uh, seems like a little bit of a warning indicator that we have essentially um, a withholding that's being put on his payroll for uh, spousal and child support. And that's happening just within days of when she's shot. We're going to get some more detail on all of that, but then wrap that up with this charge. And um, there are really no details available. I don't know who the child is. I don't know if it's inside of his family, outside of his family, something beyond that. I have no idea. But all, all of a sudden, we got a lot of very strange developments happening in this case. Uh, let's continue and see if we can learn some more about what's going on with this and does it actually all tie together or are we looking at uh, two separate crimes? By the way, he hasn't been convicted. These are charges. It was run, ran through a grand jury. They chose to indict him. So obviously they feel like there's enough information there to make a run at formally um, prosecuting him. But I can't find any updates on this case after the fact. I don't know where this case is at right now. It could still effectively be in limbo while some things are being worked out in the court process. We're going to hear about a couple of issues that's raised by his lawyer in particular. But uh, jumping back to WTVY.com, ex-husband of murdered teacher ordered to surrender passport. Records show in addition to handing over his passport to authorities, Starr is forbidden from having contact with minor children as a condition of his release from jail on $30,000 bond. Well, that of course raises a very interesting question. If he can't have contact with minor children, where are his children? This article tries to address it, but we don't know. The whereabouts of their children now isn't known because court proceedings concerning custody are not public record. Um, I would venture to guess, and that's the best I can do in this case, that the children would have been um, given to other family members to be taken care of. Uh, I don't know if they're all together at that point. I don't know if they're separated. I don't know if the family members are on Jason's side of the family or Sarah's side of the family. Uh, just another footnote from a different article at the Dothan Eagle, and I just want to really point this out because um, I've spoken to a few reporters in this area, and I think they're doing a pretty fair job with this case. Uh, his lawyer is going to suggest otherwise, but here's a, a very clear and clean statement. Coffee County Sheriff Dave Sutton previously told the Dothan Eagle there was a strong person of interest in the Sarah Starr murder case. However, Jason Starr has not been implicated. It's, they're making it clear as day. It's like, look, yeah, we know this is strange. We know a lot of people are going to think this, but we want to be clear with you guys. We have nothing that is actually saying Jason is the person that police are considering for this crime against Sarah. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's a little detail that we'll touch on by the end of this video that might throw a complete wrench in those works in terms of him possibly being involved. Uh, continuing over at southeastsun.com, Coffee Springs man pleads not guilty, seeks venue change. And this is from July 24th, 2018. On July 5th, Starr's attorney, James W. Parkman III, asked the court to move any trial on the sexual abuse charge to the nearest county outside the coverage area of local news outlets. In the request for change of venue, Parkman cited media coverage surrounding the November 27th, 2017 death of Starr's ex-wife, Sarah Starr. So obviously his lawyer is recognizing 
I mean, if you if we were talking about this from like a PR perspective, yeah, this guy's got problems. Uh, his name is coming up in relation to his wife's murder, but n really, I'm telling you, from at least from the media I'm seeing, it's not in a strong way. And let me just throw out the caveat that perhaps when the attorney complained about this, maybe those agencies took articles down that were a little more direct about that. But from the, the, the news I'm reviewing on this, I'm not seeing them trying to make a direct correlation. Uh, I'm not seeing them even kind of minorly suggesting that he might be related to this. They're simply reporting a few facts um, and they're kind of leaving it to the reader to make that connection. So um, I, I get why the lawyer is concerned. I don't know that his statements are... Uh, his statements seem a little stronger, I think, in my opinion, than they should be, at least for the media that I'm seeing around this. Although Mr. Starr was not publicly named as a suspect in the death of Ms. Starr, media coverage surrounding her death raised issues as to whether Mr. Starr could have been involved. I, I agree with that. That's certainly true. The change of venue request is where this statement is coming from. Although Mr. and Mrs. Starr were divorced at the time of her death, his name was repeatedly included in articles concerning the investigation of Ms. Starr's death. Um, I just, I don't know how you avoid that. And especially, you, I, I read some of the clips to you guys. If we're talking about the children, his name's going to come up. Where were the children at the time she was murdered? They were with their father. There's a natural connection to that story. Doesn't necessarily implicate him. There could be other situations going on here. Uh, you know, she is now effectively single when this is going on. Is she meeting other people? Is there some risk through that uh, that we don't know about at this time? Is there someone that was an admirer of hers? There, There is certainly a world of possibilities in terms of what happened to her. Um What's interesting to me is I, th I feel like it had to be someone that knew her pretty well, specifically because of how it was done. Her walking from the front door to her car, single shot to the head, leave nothing behind. Um, there's certainly a level of premeditation and someone had to know her pattern well enough to hit that window. Now, could someone have learned that pattern uh, through effectively watching her? Absolutely. Someone could have been following her around, um, but you also saw that area, a pretty rural area. And would you notice if there was an extra car on a road like that? I probably would. So um, I'm trying to put all the different conditions out there, but let's get back to the attorney's statement. In the change of venue request, Parkman notes that Mr. Starr has been deemed a strong person of interest in the murder of his ex-wife, and he now faces the charge of sexual abuse of a child, possibly two of the worst allegations that can be made against a husband and a father. Can't disagree with the second part. I don't know what he means by he has been deemed a strong person of interest. Who deemed him that? Where where is it? It you know if if you're putting something like this in there, I would include an example. I would say, hey, Dothan Eagle on this date in this article by this writer specifically said, hey, are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Jason might be related to this. Um, some type of quote to actually back that statement. It's very vague the way that this is written. Uh, because Mr. Starr was never officially pursued as the offender in Ms. Starr's death, but was consistently named as a person of interest by news outlets. Once again, vague. I'm not seeing that in the articles I'm finding. These stories have exposed the community to unfair and damaging information about the defendant. So there's an obvious question of, could he get a fair trial in this area? Um, you know, we interviewed one of the defense attorneys for Coley McCraney, the man that has been arrested for the murders of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett. That's the case from the first season of Three Men and a Mystery. And I can tell you um, that the legal team didn't really seem concerned about Coley not being able to have a fair trial in that area. Um, so in this case, I, I guess it's a little bit different. You know, the presumption in Coley's case is that he's kind of a stranger to these two girls, murdered these two girls for some reason. Um, but you have a story that has been affecting that community for 20 years, numerous articles, obviously the podcast, all kinds of different attention around that really could be tweaking public's perception of what's going on in that case. And they're, they're still going through with that case in that area. They're not going with a change of venue. 
Here, we've got this guy casually being connected to this murder that's very difficult to understand. We don't have any physical evidence being discussed here. We don't have police saying, we don't even have them talking about the caliber of weapon. We don't have them saying, we have them specifically saying they didn't find a weapon. This is an extremely challenging case. His name is being brought up in it kind of casually. Yes, I'll admit the thing about his wages possibly being garnished. Um, th that might lead people to, to think one way or another, but I do think the newspaper was fair about how they kicked out that information. Personally, I don't think there's a problem with him finding a fair trial here. I get why his lawyer's trying to change venue, um, but does it happen? We're going to find out. Let's continue. DothanEagle.com from September 20th, 2018. Coffee County Sheriff's investigators continue to pursue leads. Uh, Coffee County Chief Deputy Ronnie Whitworth is quoted. I can tell you this case has worked every day. I have one person on this case full time and others assist. This case is being worked on daily. So it's like they're, they keep make, making touches in the media just to let the community know we're still working on this. We're still working on this. Every now and then you'll get this kind of glimmer of hope statement about, hey, we're making some good progress. Um, here we get to the one year mark, November 2018. Investigation continues one year after teacher's murder. We want the community to know that Sarah Starr and her tragic murder are not forgotten, said District Attorney Tom Anderson. Sheriff Dave Sutton and his investigators continue to work diligently with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Middle District of Alabama, and my office to see that the person or persons responsible will be held accountable. So here we have a formal direct statement. FBI is now involved. What manner are they involved in? We don't know. And I can tell you, I look into many cases where um, the FBI is supposedly assisting a local police department. And basically what it means is if the local police department has something that the FBI has expertise in, they'll reach out to the FBI, maybe have them check a record, maybe have them do some type of lab testing, something like that. There's kind of different levels of involvement when it comes to the FBI. Of course, the most, the biggest level is if uh, it seems like there's some type of federal crime that's happened. If the crime uh, traverses state lines or something like that, where it makes sense that there needs to be a federal authority that's investigating that case, that's kind of the highest level of FBI involvement. But there's many different levels below that. We're not getting a clear indicator of how exactly the FBI is helping, at, at least from these statements. Um, the Enterprise Police Department and State Bureau of Investigations have consistently assisted as well, Anderson said. We are hopeful that charges will be forthcoming. So once again, kind of glimmer of light statement. Chief Deputy Ronnie Whitworth agreed the investigation is going strong. We have two investigators working that case. A little bit of a change from the last article, but this is at the one-year anniversary. It could be that renewed focus happens at that point and they assigned a second investigator. The Federal Bureau of Investigation is also involved, Whitworth said, adding that the Sheriff's Department is not at liberty to release further comment. Um, and they've done a pretty good job of being tight-lipped. I mean, even throughout this whole video, I'm sure you're getting the sense that um, they're not releasing pretty much any details. They're just wanting to assure the public it is being worked on. Every now and then they'll say, hey, we've made an interesting development. Um, I'm wondering if that article about the the interesting development is tied to the information about the wage garnishing that was happening uh, or if it's related to something else. Uh, like I said, we don't know. We don't know that uh, that the husband is necessarily the person that they're looking into with all this. Um, it could be that that interesting development is just way out in left field and we have no insight into knowing who that's pointing towards. But what's clear is they've had a person of interest, at least in their minds, pretty strong right from the start. I'm not hearing a lot of commentary from them about that changing focus. You know, sometimes I'll look into an investigation and the police will be very honest about, well, yeah, we had a person of interest. We've ruled that person out. I'm not seeing that pattern going on with this case in particular, uh, at least in terms of public comments. Over at WTVY.com, a murder case with twists and turns remains unsolved. And this is another article that kicked out at the one year anniversary. More than two years before her death, Starr's husband, Jason, filed for divorce, and court records show it was far from amicable. 
Attorneys filed motions and counter motions in an ongoing legal feud. Then, a few days before she died, a Coffee County deputy served an order on Jason Starr's employer. It compelled the company to withhold $2,550.62 per month in child support and spousal payments from Starr's check. Starr has never been publicly named a suspect, but investigators detained him on the day of his former wife's murder. Um, I think that's pretty much a normal course of action for an investigation like this. They would certainly look at spouse, uh, loved one, boyfriend, girlfriend, anyone close to the victim in that way. Multiple sources say Starr has an ironclad alibi and can't be placed at his ex-wife's home on the day of her death. After several hours of questioning, investigators released him. So I don't know who these multiple sources are. We don't know what the ironclad alibi is. This is the only mention that I've found of it anywhere. Um, I'm kind of interested in this information because if the media and the police are really concerned about painting a certain picture in terms of Jason's involvement, releasing that information publicly probably would have been helpful with that. And they didn't go about it that way. So it kind of has me looking at that statement with a very, very big question mark. I don't know how much I would rely on it. Multiple sources, what type of sources are we talking about? Are we talking about law enforcement sources? Are we talking about friends that happen to know people? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what that means. And an ironclad alibi, um, do they exist? Yes. Uh, are all alibis as ironclad as they are initially stated to be? I think we've seen cases where that certainly isn't the point. Um, the fact that he can't be placed at his ex-wife's home. I'm curious to know if he is a person of interest, I would assume the investigators would have pulled uh, his cell phone records, looked for you know ping towers or GPS information to see if he might have been in the area at the time. As a matter of fact, there's kind of a new investigative method that's going on. Uh, we saw this actually with the Terry Beavers investigation that it just just happened recently, a couple months ago. A warrant was filed. I believe it was with Google, if I recall correctly, where they wanted location information specifically for a specific spot. So in the Terry Bieber's case, we're talking about the church where she was murdered. And they wanted to know if any other cell phones were that in that area or what cell phones were in that area from a certain time range. Uh, and effectively, they're asking almost for like a geofence, like they had specific coordinates. We want from here to here to here to here. They made this this shape and they said, anyone that pops in here from 2 a.m. till 5 a.m., we want to know about those records. And initially, they ask for that without any personal identifying information. They look at the records and then if they see that something lines up and it's like, hey, you know what? There's this phone that was in that area exactly at the right time, you know, showed up right before the person showed up on the video. Um, then they would file another warrant to get the connecting information to actually learn that person's identity. So that's a little bit of a, of a newer tool that I've seen used. I think in a case like this, that might actually be a decent tool too. that same kind of request, a warrant asking Google specifically for location information related to phones in the area. We're once again talking about a church, unfortunately, um, encompassing the church and the home behind it and what cell phones appeared there that morning, I would say any time from possibly 3 a.m. forward until um, she's found around eight, somewhere in that time frame. So I don't know if police are doing that. I'm just talking about how I'd, I'd be trying to look at this with the types of developments that we've seen in, in other cases. Um, but I'm curious, you know, this statement, he can't be placed at his ex-wife's home. Uh, we know that the kids were with him. Did, was he taking the kids to school? Like there, there could be a lot of clarifying information that could have come out with this. Honestly, Jason could have even provided some of that himself. We have seen where family members will talk to the media uh, and make clarifying statements about that kind of stuff. He certainly didn't take the opportunity to do that before his charges kicked up. Um, I think it's kind of unfortunate because once again, it's... I get it. I get how this picture is looking when you look at this case, the available media in it. But I think that it could have been addressed in several different ways if he's truly innocent. Those things weren't addressed by him. Then we have statements that um, haven't been made by law enforcement. If they do, if they are aware of an ironclad alibi, I'm very surprised that they wouldn't have come out with that so that the public would know 
we have to start looking in different directions. And then, by the way, maybe release some information to help the public know what directions are we looking in. I would like to think they're going through all of Sarah's electronic records, looking for any connection to dating sites, going through her emails, messages, who she's who she talking to, what was her life like that weekend. That's another big chunk of information that we don't understand publicly that might help the public get the right information to them. Is she the type of person that went to a bar on Saturday night and maybe met somebody, somebody new that was in her life? Um, we have no idea. So. There's a lot of different factors I see going on with this case. There's a lot to theorize about that in this case because there's so few details. And it's another one, like the past few we've looked at at Brain Scratch, where it's really tough to know how to help law enforcement because um, it's so vague. We don't know what we're supposed to be looking for. But what I can say is if someone is involved in this, first of all, if this is some type of murder for hire type situation, like we were talking about in the last case that we covered on this channel, um, there's a high probability that people have been talking. There's a possibility that people could have heard conversations or have been part of those conversations, have some piece of this puzzle, and maybe they could help the investigators with this. So of course, contact information in the description box below. If you have any piece of this puzzle, please, please use it, send it in help these guys. They're working really hard trying to solve this case. I have no doubt about that. We've got a community rallying around this case. Um, but there's someone out there that has to have some piece of this puzzle and help help them find what they're looking for. And if you're that person, please find it in your heart to make that phone call. Uh, and if you need to speak anonymously in some way, there's ways to do that. You can mail a letter. Um, I've, I've seen cases where sometimes people will mail a tip in anonymously and police will actually talk through the media back to that person and say, hey, you sent us this letter. You told us about that. We need more details. You know, Please contact Crime Stoppers or something like that. Um, it could start a meaningful dialogue, even if you need to remain anonymous. This case needs help, obviously. We're coming up on two years. We've got four kids that don't know what happened to their mother. We've got a community that doesn't know what happened to someone that was helping so many children. It's um, it's just it's heartbreaking on so many different fronts. So what happened with the change of venue? Let's get back to the article. A judge denied Parkman's request that Starr's trial be moved from Coffee County, but he left the door open for the matter to be addressed again before trial and no date has been set. That's the last update that I've seen in regards to Star's trial. Um, so I'm not sure. I don't know if it's still waiting. I don't know if they're in pre-trial. I don't know if they're kicking around stuff. Um, kind of curious to see where all of that leads. One of the latest updates I have been able to find is here at Dothan Eagle. This is from March 26th, 2019. Coffee County Sheriff Dave Sutton appeared before the Coffee County Commission Monday to give updates. And here we get kind of a little crossover into the three men and a mystery case that we covered. It's all coming to light in the news media right now about the city of Ozark getting the cold murder solved over there. They pretty much know from DNA who they've got, and I just don't believe DNA lies. DNA tells the truth. But we are still moving forward with the star case that happened quite a while back. It's not gone into a cold case status. It's a very active status, and we hope to have some very good results here for you in the near future. So it's almost like the arrest of Coley McCraney kind of put pressure on some of these cases that maybe aren't officially cold, but are starting to get a little older in that area and probably made people question, hey, if these guys were able to do it with a case that's over 20 years old, how come we can't get it? you know, with this case when this happened less than two years ago. Um, I got to say, at least from the information that we've reviewed in today's video, what DNA? This could literally be a person that maybe parked on the road, took 15 steps towards the house, waited at the side of the house. Uh, she walked out, pulled a trigger, didn't leave anything behind. Um, I'm kind of curious about that because we actually haven't heard about a shell casing being left behind. It might be that there is one, or it might mean that a revolver was used where a casing actually isn't ejected. Um, but maybe the person took the 15 steps back to their car, car, got in their car, and left. 
at that, we're talking at most maybe some footprints they could have found, which by the time police got there, we know that other people had gone there to check on her well-being. Um, so that might have been damaged in some way. Uh, tire tracks that perhaps could have been found. Once again, we know other people have gone there, so there were other vehicles in the area, but you could probably do some type of exclusion on the known tires that had gone there. Um, the shell casing might be the best bet if there was one actually ejected, but uh, we certainly don't have those details here. So really tough case. Uh, don't get me wrong, J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett's case, I still think is a tough case. Um, the trial for that is actually going to start in February. And in some form, uh, I'm certainly going to get out there for a part of the trial. I don't know if I'll be able to be there for the whole thing. Um, but even that case, I think, is difficult, even with DNA. But here, we've got a case where I don't really see, at least we don't know of any possible DNA being left at the scene as it is. So... Um, that mechanism I don't think works in this case in particular. As always, I try to look for the bright spots in these stories, how people honor the victims. And there is a very sweet one that happens with this story over at southeastsun.com. Students plant memory garden in honor of slain teacher. Sarah Starr's fourth grade students remembered that she loved gardening, flowers, and books. They remember too that she grew some of her own foods in her home garden. Those were among the memories of a woman described as a beloved teacher that prompted fourth grade students at Heron Creek Elementary School to initiate a memory garden in Starr's honor. Four students from Miss Starr's class met with Mr. Rutherford, the school principal, to present the idea. Rutherford immediately supported the idea, and with the support of parents and the school administrators, the students began planning the project. After learning about the school garden, Trowick Landscaping kindly offered to donate all the plants for the project, and two families in the community agreed to donate two beautiful benches. Here we can see students actually working on the garden, and they also had a ceremony. Uh, this happened in March, uh, about four months after she had been killed. So. Another week, another tough case. Not a lot of physical evidence that we know about. I would like to think that uh, the authorities actually have a few other pieces of information that they're keeping close to the vest, but someone out there has to have some part of this puzzle. So if you think you are that person, maybe if you're not even sure, please call in that tip, use the information down below and help them with this. All right, I promised you guys a little update on Three Men and a Mystery. Three Men and a Mystery is growing. It will be growing into its own YouTube channel. That is going to be happening in November, and we will be doing that coinciding with the premiere of Season 2. And what is Season 2 of Three Men and a Mystery going to be about? It's a case we've talked about here on Brain Scratch before. We're calling Season 2 Silenced, the death of Elisa Gomez. Uh, this is a case that is very tough to understand. I've been in contact with the family for a long time, basically since that first video was posted. Um, I've been brought into the fold of tons of information. I literally have a binder of hundreds of pages uh, to the left of me. Uh, on top of that, we've been provided access to a lot of uh, records, uh, body cam footage, interviews with people that were at the scene, uh, a lot of material that I don't typically get access to. So this is going to be a deep dive. Uh, obviously, season one was a deep dive, but more through the media's focus. This one's going to be different because we've got access to the materials ourselves. Uh, on top of that, Gray, Morph, and myself are working really hard to uh, get the right interviews, pull in some experts. We've got a really kind of big special guest expert already on deck. Of course, some of our previous experts are going to be coming back. Sarah Kalin will certainly be coming back to give us some analysis on what she thinks of a possible person of interest in that case. Um, we're working really hard on this season. It's going to be broken up kind of into two parts. We're going to start premiering it in November. Uh, it's going to run until almost the end of the year. Then we'll be off for the holidays. And then uh, sometime late January, it'll pick back up and then we'll finish off season two. So new YouTube channel coming. Same three men, different mystery, 
whole bunch of details that, uh, quite honestly, we didn't get into on the brain scratch I did here because I didn't have access to all those records. But we want to see if we can help Elisa's family find some justice and peace in all of this. So I hope you guys will check that out. Uh, before I end today's video, got a few people to thank in terms of patrons, starting with Jennifer, who increased her pledge and sent me a very sweet message. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I really appreciate that. And new patron, it's either Covey or Covey. So I'm going to say it both ways. And I know I'm, I was right for one and I was wrong for the other. But thank you so much for the support. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do that over at www.lordandarts.com. You could sign up for PayPal, sign up for Patreon. Buy merchandise, buy the audiobook. All of it helps keep me here doing what I love doing, spending time with you guys and helping these many families that we see in these really, really tough situations. We can't forget about these people. And I really appreciate having your support, trying to raise awareness, trying to raise focus, and trying to get that right tip called in. Have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you back here on Monday with a brand new episode of Case Cracked on the Lord and Arts channel.